The Forest Temple theme is one of the most complex pieces of music within Ocarina of Time. Not from a performance perspective, not that that really matters, or really in the number of pieces making up its construction, but rather from an emotional framing, or its affect. What does this music make you feel? I'm sure if I had people who have never played the game listen to it and tell me what it made them feel, I'd get a pretty wide variety of answers. Compare that to, say, this song. Or this one. I'd reckon the latter two songs would have way more homogenous responses. Words I might use to describe it would be foreboding, haunting, alien or ancient, and yet at the same time, serene, comforting or delicate. In this way, it's really dissonant. I don't mean that in the harmonic sense, although it is pretty dissonant in that way as we'll discuss later, but rather in its affect. It portrays emotions that we might describe as opposing one another, but they're happening simultaneously, in some sort of emotional composite or meta-affect. The rubbing of these emotions creates the feeling of disorientation. The track is, in this way, well, puzzling. My goal with this video series is, just like how Link traverses and solves the labyrinth that is the Forest Temple in Ocarina of Time, to unravel and decode Koji Kondo's emotionally challenging and nuanced Forest Temple theme. In this first video, we'll be unraveling its harmonic construction. Before we get into the thick of it, you'll have a way easier time understanding this video in particular if you have some basic music theory under your belt. We'll be primarily talking about modes, including modes outside of the ones derived from the major scale. I'll be explaining things in a way that should make sense even if you had no idea what any of that meant, but looking into what modes are as well as how they're made can only help your understanding. Other than that, knowing what a scale is and how we describe its different elements, what chords are and how they're constructed, as well as how a chord progression works will be really just expected for this video. Also, this is all just my opinion on something totally subjective, so... The role of music as a component within a greater work, like that of film, television, and video games, is often to convey and enhance the feeling being presented. Music can be used to portray emotional states, like the joy of a holiday dinner, the grief of a lost loved one, the rapidly changing emotions of a character realizing who the killer is. The tension and dread building as you notice the shadowy figure moving towards you in the window. What kinds of ways can a composer create these feelings? That answer really lies within every aspect of a piece of music's composition. From the instrumentation, to the creation of different textures, the expression of the performers, to the rhythm and meter, everything is important. One incredibly effective way that a modern composer for film, television, and video games can evoke certain feelings is through the use of modes. For today's simplified purposes, modes are just scales outside of major and minor. And just like major and minor, we can write music using these scales. 
Just like how you may feel something different listening to a piece in minor versus major, the different modes all have their own unique sound and thus different feelings and associations we make when we listen to them. Now as a disclaimer, just like major and minor, there are plenty of different feelings that can be expressed through each scale. Each one might have certain feelings associated with it, but that's not the end all be all. The rest of the composition plays a huge part in creating an affect. The scale is just a piece of it. For instance, the Lost Woods theme uses a mode called Lydian, a scale similar to major, but with a raised fourth scale degree. This mode is brighter than major, and is often used to invoke an uplifting feeling, or a sense of magic or wonderment. Zelda's Lullaby also uses the Lydian mode. The Hyrule Field theme is in a mode called Mixolydian, which is major with a flat seventh. This mode is often used to create a sense of adventure or to invoke a medieval or Celtic setting. I'm sure you get the connection there, but the scale is also used all the time in folk, blues, jazz, and rock music. Here are some other songs that use modes to invoke a feeling within the game. Now, the reason I'm bringing all of this up is because obviously modes are part of what makes up the disorienting atmosphere of the Forest Temple theme but there's actually a little more to it. Koji Kondo implements a pretty advanced technique within this theme called polymodality. What polymodality means is that there are two or more simultaneous modes going on at the same time. Note that if you're into music theory, this is a little different from polytonality in which multiple key centers are used. The two modes have the same root, E, but each use different sets of notes or modes around E. What polymodality allows for in terms of emotional affect is to enable not only one or two modes, each with their own, I'm using big quotes here, meaning, but also for a third composite meaning coming from the juxtaposition of the two scales. Polymodality is often not, at least conventionally, the prettiest sounding technique, in fact, Koji Kondo is using two modes that are pretty similar to each other as we'll discuss later, so this is far from an extreme example. This ugly sound is due to the creation of intervals and especially dissonances in places that just don't exist within a single mode unless you're using a really out there scale. In a harmonic sense, this is where the complex emotional expression is coming from. But it doesn't just go as deep as the usage of this technique, rather it comes from how it's implemented. If this track was a Zelda dungeon itself, the technique of polymodality is just the dungeon item. We can use it to solve all of the puzzles in the dungeon, but we need to figure out how it needs to be used to actually solve those puzzles, or how it gets us to the emotional state of the Forest Temple theme. So in order to do that, we'll need to look at each individual voice that makes up the track. The first voice you encounter is the rattling noise immediately when you enter the dungeon. This sound is pitched at a B the entire time. Like I said earlier, our root for this song is E, and the track revolves around the E major chord. B is actually a very neutral note in both of the modes being used, and is a note that is functional in every chord played in the song. So we can more or less ignore this voice in terms of harmonic function. The second voice is this sort of eerie sound playing semi-melodic intervals that combine to create chords. The exact ordering of these intervals changes between different instances, but the notes combine to create two distinct chordal areas. We have our E major chord comprised of the first two sets of intervals, making up our root or tonic chord. Then we have this D minor chord, 
or if we add the B from the rattling sound, it's a B half diminished chord. I'm just going to call it D minor. In this context, it really functions the same way in either case. This next little bit is going to be for people who know a little more music theory, specifically where modes come from. So if you're not familiar with the concept, just hold tight and it'll get back to making sense pretty quickly. If you are comfortable with your modes, you might realize that D minor and E major are not both in any of the modes you may be familiar with, which is a little odd. I'll lay out both chords on the piano so we can see what kind of scales these chords might come from. We're missing one note, but otherwise you might recognize this as the A harmonic minor scale. The C is missing, but all of the other notes are there. The only problem is that our home key is E major and not A minor. So how could it be A harmonic minor? The answer is that, well, it's not really harmonic minor, it's a mode of harmonic minor. Just like how we can take our major scale and derive our modes by starting on a different scale degree, we can do the same exact thing to any other scale. In this case, we're starting off of the fifth scale degree of harmonic minor. This creates a scale called Phrygian Dominant. The scale requires two transformations off of the minor scale to get to. First, we lower the second scale degree of the minor scale, making a darker version of minor called Phrygian. Then we raise the third scale degree, making it a major third instead of a minor third. This scale may look strange, but it actually comes up pretty frequently. This mode is often what a general Western audience associates with Arabian or broadly Middle Eastern music. first key attribute of the scale is the lowered second scale degree. This is the characteristic tone of Phrygian. It's in many ways opposite to the bright Lydian that we talked about earlier. Phrygian sounds dark, foreboding, even evil. It comes up all the time in themes of enemies and evildoers within video games, and is frequently used in metal and heavier popular genres. The flat 2 is interesting in that it dangles right over the tonic note of the scale, which creates a strong downward polarity to the root. This is what creates the sinister sound of Phrygian. When looking at the force temple chords, you may have noticed that the D minor chord has an F in the bass and not a D. This inversion strengthens the Phrygian attribute by placing the flat 2 to 1 motion in the bass line where it can act more as a foundation to the progression and be more prominent to our ears. The other key piece of the scale, the raised third, allows for the creation of even more tension. Firstly, the combination of the flat two and the raised third create an abnormally large interval between the second and third scale degrees. This interval, called an augmented second, is even larger than a major second. This interval, when combined with its surrounding notes, is what tends to make the scale have what Western audiences hear as that sort of Middle Eastern color. I find that this interval can actually overtake the color of scales that have it, so unless I'm going for that sound specifically, I try to avoid passing over it in any of my voices. Koji Kondo does the same here, which keeps the chord progression from feeling like it has any sort of definite foreign color. The raised third also allows for the strong 4-3 motion by half step that commonly occurs in major. In classical music, this often comes in the form of suspensions or the resolution of dominant seventh chords. When combined with the flat two to one motion, the resolution from the D minor chord to the E major chord is strengthened. The D minor chord feels heavy, like it needs to fall back to its resting position. This is the exact same chordal motion that you often have in minor when going from a flat 6 or 4 chord in first inversion to a dominant chord. 
The difference here is that instead of going to a dominant chord that wants to resolve, i.e. moving toward a point of tension, in Phrygian dominant, it's moving to our home chord, a point of rest. So how could this voice be described in terms of affect? We have an understanding of what's happening, but how does that translate into feeling? The weight of the D minor chord down to the E major root is amplified by resolving two pitches by half step. I feel this weight translates into a great amount of tension, but not a conventional tension. It's off, but it's not as transparent as, say, a normal dominant chord might be. The strange chord relations due to the mode add to this subtle tension. Things don't move how you usually expect them to, which creates a certain uncanniness. It's eerie. The progression makes sense to your ear, but it's not what your ear expects. The uncertainty combined with the dark weight of the Phrygian dominant scale is what makes it feel haunting and foreboding. The unfamiliarity is what makes it feel alien. Another thing I love about this progression is the texture that it's expressed through. As stated earlier, the progression moves in the form of semi-melodic intervals. The D in the D minor chord is played only on the second pass through of the progression, and the upper voice leaps to do so out of a constrained space. It's like it's fighting against the weight of the progression, like it's struggling to reach out for the darkness for something before being pulled back. It not only makes the progression more dynamic, but more stressful as well. All of that stress falls back on a warm major chord. The juxtaposition of the heavy D minor falling back to the warm E major creates an extra layer of tension that you couldn't get within a natural mode. The jump from one of these effectual polarities to the other heightens their effectiveness. The warm E major feels even more comforting because we came from such a tenuous chord compared to it, and the heavy D minor feels even stronger because of its distance from the E major. This extremified oscillation between two opposing feelings is foundational to the disorienting affect of the Forest Temple theme. But it's far from the only or the most prominent contributor. Now, after all of that, we have the other voice existing in an entirely separate mode. The flute and chant-like sound combine to create a sparsely moving melodic line. The voice only ever encompasses five notes. We have this pair spaced at a major third, and this second pair at the same interval a whole step below. These four notes make up the vast majority of this line, but it does eventually develop and reach up to this F sharp and A. And it kind of exists in an interesting modal space. Our root note is an E, so we have enough context to label this scale as E mixolydian. Like I stated earlier, mixolydian is similar to the major scale, but with a flattened seventh. I also gave a number of common qualifiers connecting the scale to things like the feeling of adventure, folk and popular music, or Celtic or medieval colors. This melody doesn't really embody any of those despite pretty clearly being in mixolydian. First off, this is really awesome, as it's a clear example that modes and scales aren't monolithic in their possibilities for expression. And second, why does it not sound characteristically mixolydian despite clearly giving enough information for us to tell that it is mixolydian? I think the answer to this is twofold. For one, the voice is introduced in the piece after the Phrygian dominant voice has completed a cycle of its progression. This more or less has created a modal foundation for our ear, so when a new mode is introduced, it warps our perception of it. Instead of hearing Mixolydian from nothing, we're hearing it with a Phrygian dominant bias. The other reason is where this melody exists within the Mixolydian scale. For most of the track, the melody entirely exists within four notes separated by whole step. This section of the scale resembles another scale called the whole tone scale, a six note scale entirely formed of whole steps. I won't go too into why, but this scale has a floaty, lost quality. You've heard it all over the place in film and TV. It's the absolute cliche dream sequence melody, 
and also the chest opening sound. Due to its symmetrical construction, none of the notes in the scale really point anywhere. There are no tendency tones, and the root isn't all that obvious in a vacuum. What makes this useful for composing is that you can exhibit uncertainty very easily by using this scale. I believe that Koji Kondo intentionally uses this whole tone sequence within Mixolydian to exhibit exactly this lost feeling. He does this throughout the Ocarina of Time soundtrack, one example being within the Lost Woods theme. The Lost Woods theme being the literal embodiment of uncertainty in the game. I mentioned earlier though that this voice eventually develops and extends out to an additional note, the A up above. If you look at the keyboard, this breaks the whole tone motif that we established prior, and in a way grounds and resolves it. Just listen as the note is reached. The melody suddenly feels warm and decisive for a moment. This exact shape is really common within Lydian, the five notes of this melody being the first five notes of the scale, including Lydian's characteristic raised fourth, which resolves up to its fifth just like in this melody. Because of this, I kind of need to place an asterisk next to Mixolydian when I label this voice as mode. In reference to the root or tonic, the mode is Mixolydian, but the melody itself follows a very D-Lydian sounding structure even resolving up to an A, which is very much not a resolution point in E. This is made even more unclear by the fact that the E tonic is expressed primarily through the other voice, which we've already established is by design harmonically separate from our flute line. Maybe there's an argument that we can interpret this voice as actually being in D Lydian instead. But as we put the two lines together, I think this argument is a little weaker. What may be the real question is if it really actually matters. This track is already kind of out there, and neatly fitting this voice into a single mode might not actually be effective in making it any clearer. Like I've already tried to make apparent, the specific notes within these modes are what portray the emotional expression, not so much where those pitches come from. In any case, the set of notes does not fit in with the Phrygian dominant of the other voice. The final component of the harmony is the synthesis of the two voices and their modes. This is really where I think the main component of the essence of this track comes from, but understanding the two voices individually is pretty important in understanding how they interact. To begin with, we'll check how compatible these modes are over each other. We'll start by overlaying the two scales to see where they share notes and where they differentiate. As you can see, only two of the notes clash, the second and the sixth scale degrees. But not every pitch is actually used in each voice, meaning that those tensions just don't exist. If we remove the unused pitches, it actually moves down to only a single scale degree, the second that conflicts. With this, we can see that the actual difference between these two modes as they're expressed is really minute. The second scale degree within Phrygian dominant is the flat two, an F natural in this case, and in Mixolydian, it's a major second, an F sharp. With how they're oriented in the piece, the F natural is always lower, making their interval a minor ninth. This is a conventionally ugly sounding interval, like it's the ugly sounding interval. It's usually used in really dissonant sounding chords, like the dominant flat nine chord, with the intention that it'll be resolved. In this case, however, the actual interval isn't ever resolved, and the inclusion of the non-native note in both of the modes doesn't really make much sense. We do have an element that does separate these two modes outside of the strict harmony though, and that's the instrumentation. Each mode exists solely within a single timbre, which helps our brains distinguish and separate the two. The F sharp only ever occurs in the flute line, and it exists specifically to function within that line. Same for the F natural within its chords. 
This is the important thing to note with Kondo's use of polymodality here. The two lines are separate ideas, and they aren't always supposed to work as one unit. The interest lies in the juxtaposition, how the voices clash or align. It should be also noted that the dissonant notes producing the separation aren't always present, and the modal clashing of sorts only occurs when both are present. For simplicity, I'm going to divide each voice into safe zones and unsafe zones. The safe zone is where the two voices coexist and are at least inhabitable with each other within a single mode. The unsafe zones are where the two modes clash. The unsafe zones aren't dissonant on their own, but when both unsafe zones overlap, this polymodal dissonance occurs. Basically, the unsafe zones occur wherever the second scale degrees are played in their respective modes. For the Phrygian dominant voice, the safe zone is on the E major chord, and the unsafe zone is during the D minor chord. For the Mixolydian voice, the safe zone is during the E and G sharp interval, and the unsafe zone is during the D and F sharp. The two voices sound like they belong together modally when at least one of them is in a safe zone. This is because without the context of the second, the safe voice can just fit in with the other mode. For example, say the Phrygian dominant voice is on its safe E major, and the Mixolydian voice is on its unsafe D and F sharp. The entire thing will sound as though we're in E Mixolydian during that instance because there's nothing telling us otherwise. There's no F natural. The whole thing will sound as though it's in Phrygian dominant when its voice is in its own unsafe zone and the Mixolydian voice is in its safe zone. What we get during these instances is, rather than two separate voices establishing different modes simultaneously, we get an oscillation between the two. One mode is always expressed, while the other stands in the background and supports it. When both voices are in the unsafe zone, the voices begin to tear apart and it starts to feel really unsettling. The voices are pretty clearly divided to their register and timbre though, so it doesn't just sound like mush, but instead the two voices stop working together and walk in different directions. Take a listen to the shift between voices working together and then pushing against each other. It's slight. Only one note is actually different, but this extra dimension all of a sudden exists. Not a dissonance in the chordal sense, although that's definitely there making it unsettling, but a dissonance in harmonic unity. This is a dimension that people rarely hear, and Koji Kondo does an amazing job of creating motion within it. The effect is further created in that when the D minor chord is voiced, even the E and G sharp in the Mixolydian voice clash with those notes. It still sounds like the correct mode, but the voices still sound to be working in different spaces. The music oscillates between what feels like a single piece of music and two separate musical ideas pulling away from each other. And again, it's so slight due to the choice of modes that it doesn't feel hyper pronounced. You feel it, but you don't really notice it on a first listen. This is the key to the affect that Koji Kondo is creating with this track. The eeriness, the tension, the opposing forces exist because we have this push and pull between so many elements. We have a push and pull between the heavy, dark weight of Phrygian dominant and the light and floaty Mixolydian, as well as the warmth and stability of voices when they're unified and the unfamiliar tension of the polymodality. The subtlety of these elements creating the feeling that something is off, but you just can't tell what. Somehow after all of that, we've only discussed the harmonic side of this track's composition. In the next video, we'll go through how the other elements, including the rhythm, meter, form, basically anything having to do with timing, the instrumentation, and some miscellaneous elements all contribute to the mood in the same way that the harmony does. So if you aren't subscribed and you'd like to explore this music more with me, doing so would really help me out. Alright, thanks for listening.